All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess uh, you're going to listen first from the dark side, and then you'll go back to the developing country manufacturers to feed you. To feed you, okay. Um, so today um, uh, we are just going to try and make uh, a very interactive uh, talk. So I'm just going to be asking you a lot of questions. And actually, I just need three volunteers um, later on. But uh, so be ready because I will just need three volunteers. So if somebody would like to, to be a volunteer, just then later on raise, raise your hands. Okay. What I'm just going to try and talk to you, first of all, I'm just representing the entire uh, vaccine industry. So any, <laughs> I probably, uh, see, I'm very humble. Um, but uh, no, uh, the reason I say that is because I am not going to talk about Pfizer or any product uh, from Pfizer. What I'm just going to try here is to, in order to try as much as possible, represent um, my colleagues from other vaccine manufacturers, is to try and give you a little bit an idea at a senior management, what are the steps that one need to do before investing? I mean, thinking about in industry, when you make decisions about in investments of billions of dollars on a vaccine, well, what are the decisions? And hopefully you can help me um, making those decisions. But let's start with the basics uh, first. So, um, what, what this slide shows is that um, vaccines, contrary to what many people think, it's a very attractive business uh, segment, and you do not necessarily need to be a pandemic, really, to to have uh, a very a very attractive business segment. And as you can see over there, I mean, vaccines um, there was so there is expected to be a growth up to t uh, up to this year of twelve percent, and 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 possibly this is. This is going to increase, and there are some characteristics that vaccine have in terms of financial opportunities that are that are very different um, than drugs, and we can talk later um, about this. But just to give you an idea um, about the different um, vaccine market segments that you can think, and again, this can be divided in many. I've just I've just tried to divide it in eight vaccine um, segments. And, and the first one um, are vaccines that are devoted for prevention of pediatrics, uh, less than five years of age. And you have the traditional pediatric, uh, the former, when I was working at the World Health Organization, we call them the EPI vaccines, the expanded program on immunization vaccines. Those are now commodity based vaccines and they're based on older technologies. And you'll hear later on that the Serum Institute of India, not only now it's the first producer for all EPI vaccines, but also um, it's, they are targeting the, what we call the specialty pediatrics. So it's newly targeted, uh, pediatric diseases. Obviously, they're not so new anymore. Um, you have the pneumococcal, uh, the pneumococcal vaccines, the pneumococcal conjugates, and you have obviously very, um, different generations. Um, it started with the seven valent, then you have a 10 valent, a 13 valent, 15 valent, and now 20 valent. And we'll see if we can stick together more settled types in the future. Uh, you have rotavirus or uh, meningococcal conjugate vaccines. Now, then you have a different segment. Um, uh, the segment is uh, vaccines that are devoted for adults. And then you can just have those vaccines that were given. And I think Professor Anderson gave you uh, some idea that some vaccines have duration of protections, other vaccines wane immunity, and you might just need to give a booster. And I give you uh, a few a few examples over there. Then you have the specialty vaccines just targeted for adults um, as well, um, whether it's the HPV vaccines, um, pneumococcal vaccines targeting 65 and older or 18 to 64 with risk conditions or the, the herpes and, and herpes zoster and you have Sostavax or Shingrix. 
Now, there are going to be new vaccines that are being targeted for maternal immunization to prevent, to prevent neonates. And that's a platform that a few years ago was really not being pursued by vaccine industry because of litigations. I think now with the uh, administration of influenza or Tdap, now with COVID-19 vaccines, for the first time, you're going to have vaccines that are exclusively targeted for maternal immunization whether RSV or whether or whether GBS. And then you have a, a, a bunch of, of categories. Um, whether uh, for travelers and endemic, there are vaccines that are exclusively um, devoted for diseases that are in the most impoverished countries. Um, um, for instance, the typhoid fever, the, the, the cholera, the meningitis which is the project that I spent um, most of my tenure at, at WHO doing. Then you have the seasonal or pandemic, uh, obviously flu, and you've heard about chikungunya or Zika, but obviously now if COVID-19 starts becoming a seasonal respiratory illness, you are likely to be seeing annual administration of, of vaccines against covid you have um, uh, therapeutic, and then um, those uh, therapeutic vaccines are those like for oncology or CNS, and then the special special populations like staph aureus uh, or C. difficile, which are not necessarily targeting um, um, just an age-based population, but maybe targeting some special special surgeries or some special populations. Again, as you can see, I mean, there is a huge development development portfolio. So the question is, when industry is thinking about is thinking about developing a new vaccine, what um, what what are the parameters that one need to consider? Okay, so welcome to a new vaccine company. We are going to call it Vacurion. It does not exist, obviously, but <laughs> but I just need uh, okay three volunteers to become senior R and D executives now from Bacurium. Who does want to be these volunteers and run with me this decision making? Okay, I see that you guys are not shy. There's so many hands that I cannot. Okay, <laughs> this is one, and your name I cannot. Dennis. Dennis Christensen. Okay, Dennis, I have one. Dennis, anybody else? Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, Dennis, Ia, and I need a woman now. No, and I need a woman now. Okay. Rita. Rita, Ia, and Dennis. Okay. So, um, and then obviously all of you can, can intervene, can intervene as well. I mean, or you can help. Uh, you can help Dennis, Rita, and Ia in, in their journey. So we are, I'm going to introduce you, um, as senior R&D executives. We are developing a new vaccines and the new vaccines, the name, so that nobody is susceptible. It's going to be called Microbian Horribilis. <laughs> and, and I'm just, uh, I'm just going to introduce Microbian Horribilis to, to, to all of you. Okay. But especially to Ia, Rita, and Dennis. Okay, you guys, uh, microbial horribilis causes both invasive and non-invasive disease. And it can cause from skin infections to bacteremic and meningitis. Um, uh, the seven, there are seven different, uh, serotypes caused by, that are causing the majority of disease. There is multi-drug resistance. So this is becoming a public, uh, health emergency. And as you can see in the, in the graphic, in the graphic below, here it is in the graphic below, like many other infectious diseases, I mean, there is very, very high prevalent at very, very low ages and very high prevalent at, uh, in the elderly as well. So not, not surprising. Okay. You guys think about because this is the vaccine that you guys are doing R&D. Okay. So there are uh, the antigens. You've discovered um, a couple of surface expressed and conserved antigen, uh, antigens, a couple of proteins that are able to target all the, the different the, dis, the different serotypes and are able to elicit functional antibodies. Those are measured either by the OPA or by CLIA. 
And it's um, uh, effective um, in preventing um, in all ages and, and all, the, all the strains, at least in preclinical, in preclinical models. Now in mouse model, and this, is, and this is the vaccine discovery, but in your department, your boss is very generous and say, okay, let's go and let's do a first thing in clinical and let's go and see whether, whether the, w- this works or not. Okay, so... Um, this is now, you are now doing vaccine development and, um, and proof of concept. And I'm just showing you the phase one and phase two. Um, this is the results with um, the antibodies that was elicited to the protein B, one of the antigens, but also protein A. And as you can see, there is acceptable safety and tolerability after a three-dose regimen. There is substantial um, opsonophagocytic titers observed after two and three doses, and the antibody responses are maintained in 12 months. Okay, I mean, looks great, isn't it? Looks looks a great vaccine. Okay, so, um, all right. So this is uh, the first decision that that I, I like you three to help me make. Well, not help me make, persuade me. I have the money now. I mean, I'm just in senior management. You have to convince me. So um, the question that we all should be asking ourselves is, okay, you have all that, all that uh, several years of scientific research, discovery and development and starting clinical trials. And your question is, okay, should we invest to launch, to launch this vaccine? Okay. Now, um, the question, the, the way we are going to analyze this is the expected net present value of this vaccine, okay? And what I'm just showing you is the typical vaccine clinical development pro- program. Perhaps pre-pandemic, in the pandemic, you know that, that, that things were shortened. But, but suppose, I mean, this is a normal clinical program. We have what it shows you in the year one is where we are. We've shown proof of concept. It's safe. It's an immunogenic. What we want is to have a phase 2B clinical trial, perhaps um, have an EOP is end of phase two. That's an FDA term. You have to, to discuss with the regulators, okay, what it's going to be on my phase three efficacy, lock to lock consistency. You get uh, filing to the boards of health, and then you get approval. Around eight years, you can uh, condense that depending on the clinical development. Okay, Ia, uh, Rita, and Dennis, all right? It's it's clear so far, no? All right. Okay, so um, you come and say, well, the clinical development costs to do all these are $500 million. And at the same time, at the same time, I have my sort of financial, marketing colleagues, medical, all of them saying, oh my goodness, this is an amazing opportunity. There is going to be, Two billion dollars, uh, two billion dollars as, as a financial opportunity. So the net value of this is the two billion dollars minus the, the 500 million dollars, the 1.5 billion dollars. And my question to you, Dennis, Ia, and, uh, and Rita is, should we invest for 1.5 billion dollars? Yes or no? Or should we throw it away? Yes, Rita says yes. Okay, Dennis, well, should we? Yeah? Any any objections to investing in this or no? Uh, that depends on the start I measure in the... I said it would depend on certain uh, factors. Probably we start by measuring the, the burden of the disease first the vaccine is going to address. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, all of that is over there is $2 billion. I mean, we already have looked at the medical need and how much money we are going to make. And it's going to be $2 billion. I thought, I told you the science is safety and immunogenicity. You have, you have 500 million. So yeah, $1.5 billion is good or bad. It's good. It's good. Okay. <laughs> All right, so it's good. It's good. Any naysayers here? All right, no, good. Okay, um, so we answer yes. The first question is, this is a good investment opportunity, and, and people say yes. Say yes, $1.5 billion is a good investment opportunity. 
No. Um, so what I said was not net value. I, I said expected, expected net value of the program. No, I mean, you, you, you forget a little bit that word over there. Huh? Um, so the, the, the question about the expected, it's not so much about is, okay, what is the probability of technical and regulatory success? I mean, um, I have safety and immunogenicity, but I have to do a large phase three clinical trials. I still do not know whether my regulators are going to approve it, not approve it. I mean, it's, it's, so at the end of the day, um, the, my probability of technical and regulatory success is 40%. Now, and we have to look that uh, in, in the equation. So that would be 2,000 uh, multiplied by 0 0.4 minus, so it's $300 million. I mean, it's not $1.5 billion, it's $300 million. And I apologize, I should have said that in the beginning. Uh, uh, but still, but still, what about, what about 300, what about 300 million dollars, Rita? Uh, it's still pretty good to me. Not, not as great, but what, what about Dennis? Or you are now, you are now are kind of sort of a skeptical. No, 300 million dollars make, make sense. Well, well, I, I still think it's, it's pretty low, uh, compared to the, the risk, since you risk 500 million and you only have 40% probability and on top of that what's the competitive uh, field no competitors that's it <laughs> so you are alone in your field there is one hand over there yes you could apply for regulatory for scientific advice at a regulatory agency and increase your probability of regulatory success yeah we we tried i mean we we had conversations with them but norman norman was tough i mean norman was saying you guys say that, uh, yeah, but still it's $300 million for God's sake. I mean, it's, it's quite a lot. Should we go ahead or not? It's okay with me. It's okay with you. Okay. That's at least okay. Yeah. Are you okay? Are, yeah. 300 million. I know that you are a little bit disappointed from the $1.5 billion, but. But isn't. Aren't the alternative? Oh, sorry, uh, Helen England, Sweden. Um, aren't the alternatives either you get nothing or you get two billion? Uh, well, what do you mean? So there's a forty percent chance that you earn two billion, right? And it's a sixty percent chance you get nothing. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, you have to so risk. Yeah, there is a risk for three hundred. I mean, million. well, but again, I mean, the five hundred million dollars. I mean, it's not like you. I mean, you might save something. You have to make a decision on whether to launch this, and you know that you have forty percent, forty percent of regular. Probably you'll have, I don't know, sixty percent of technical success, and you'll have. Um, something like 65%. And at the end of the day, when you compound it, it's 40%. I'll teach you later on how you do it. But again, this is, but my question to you is $300 million seems to be a good investment. I mean, if you get a return on investment, you are investing and then you are getting $300 million. Somebody, do you guys want me to advance one more? And then we can discuss it. Excuse me. One more. Yeah. No, you don't. You don't want me to advance. Okay. You are not convinced that the $300 million is good. You're not convinced. Okay. $300 million are not good? No. So you only, you only um, would like to do investments of $1 billion? <laughs> well, $300 million is a good investment. Okay. The question is that it's not the $300 million. What I told you is the expected net present value. So you guys were just, I mean, really greedy. I mean, oh, $300 million is not. It's not because $300 million is bad. It's because at the end of the day, you have to look at expected net present value of the program. And what does it mean? What it means is, and I think you started um, 
to to discuss about it is that you can think when you said okay is is um a two billion or nothing well i mean i can invest these 500 million dollars in the bank and i can have sort of five uh, percent of of interest rates so the question is if i invest it now so instead of just doing a vaccine what i'm doing is just i invest it now and i have an interest rate then i have 105 uh, in year one 110 i'm starting so what happens is what is a hundred dollars worth today is 95 what it's in year two i mean if you have two years is 91 or in three years is 86 so actually the net worth of your funding right now is less than what the numbers say so the present value is the future cash flow a, a stream expressed in today's terms and that's why when you do all the calculations that you had, instead of 500 million, yes, it's true, the present value is $350 million, but the, the financial opportunity is not 2 billion, it's only 650 million. So with a risk, such a big risk, which is such a PTRS of 40%, actually you have a minus 90 million dollars and at this moment dennis ia and rita are fired <laughs> but, but anyway but you guys but not all of you would have been fired because it looks like that 300 million dollars is not such a great investment but that's not really the reason. It's, it's because there are elements. But let, let's get now a little bit more into, into the more technical. When we say 40%, and again, uh, I'm doing this in 45 minutes, these take months. For people that have been involved in this, you know that there are benchmarks and it takes much, much longer. But what is the probability of technical and regulatory success, which if you ever go to, um, uh, to vaccine industry, or even if you don't in the, in the public sector, you should also be thinking about this. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of, of uh, two problems. Okay. This gets a little bit more scientific. And now I'm going to use, since my colleagues are fired, I'm going to use other, other, other people here to answer. Okay. So those are the, the, the PTRS assumptions. No probability of technical and regulatory success. We said that we have the proof of concept. We have phase two B, phase three, and, and the overall, that's the probability of technical success. Then you have the probability of regulatory success. I think over there in the corner, you told me, well, we can negotiate with the uh, regulators. We can. And that's, that's, that's where we have to, to look so that we can have, um, a full, uh, PTRS. Okay. So you have two clinical programs. And now bear with me. You have two different clinical programs. The, in the, the first one for microbial horribilis in the first one, you have, there is a threshold level of immune responses that correlates of protection. Phase 2B measures safety and immunogenicity. And phase 3, it's a larger safety and immunogenicity. But as it was mentioned, I have agreed with Norman already um, what are my pre-specified immunological criteria. So if in a phase 2B, I already look whether it's the percentage of individuals reaching a threshold, whether our GMTs, I already have a pretty good idea on whether I'm just going to have a good program or not. There is the second program. There is not an established correlate of protection. In COVID-19, we didn't know, no? Was there a correlate? Is there still a correlate of protection? I don't think so. Phase two, again, measures safety and immunogenicity. You already sort of try to associate that those uh, immune responses are likely to give you some more efficacy. Phase three, then you have to do a randomized. This is not a safety and immunogenicity anymore. You have to do a randomized double blind placebo control efficacy trial in this in a subpopulation at risk and the label 
will cover in this program from Microbium Horribilis, you are doing your phase three in a subpopulation at risk, and then you want to extrapolate to all other different populations. And that's where your regulatory person can say, really? Are you going to extrapolate these to another pop? Why? What is the biological plausibility? Okay. So, um, yeah, this is easy. Which clinical program has the, um, um, the higher PTRS? Left or right? Anybody, anybody thinks that the right is the higher PTRS? Okay. This time I didn't cheat you. It's true. It's, it's the left. Um, and what would be, then you have to calculate exactly, it's the left. What, what you have to calculate? Okay. I mean, um, the phase one trial, the POC shown this vaccine to be safe and immunogenic. So you think that the phase two B trial is likely to be the, the same. You have an 80% in the phase three because immune responses in previous trials have elicited several fall higher titers than pre-specified criteria, unless there is something in your essay or, or or something in your logistics is is likely that the probability of technical success is going to be very high. You've negotiated with Norman already, and you have already a correlate of protection, whatever that correlate it is. It's a one microgram per ml for the seven serotypes uh, and 60% or 70% of individuals reaching that level. Depending on what you've negotiated, you've already negotiated. So if you've already negotiated and you are successful, you have a 90%. Uh, probability of, of, of success. And then the PTRS would be around 65%. So when you do, when you do your famous calculation, and probably in this particular case, it would be even higher, but when you do your famous calculations, that would be positive. That would be a 72. Now, what happens with the, with the other program? Again, I told you what were the conditions. So the phase two, you already think that the phase two safety and immunogenicity is likely to be very high because that's what you had in your previous trial. So Ian is telling me, come on, I'm in phase two B. I mean, I've shown you first phase two A, why should be any different? And I say, okay, I, I, I get it, 85%. However, um, in, in phase three, I'm just starting to say, well, I mean, is it really? I mean, does it really correlate with what, what is the evidence? And then the efficacy is just likely to be in a subpopulation. I mean, are we going to extrapolate? Do we think that we can? So with an overall of 42%, that means that I have to finish? No, if, oh. you need, if you stand there, you need to move the mic. Oh, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, so um, the PRS, again, the probability of regulatory success is likely to be much lower because you have to persuade. You do not want an indication of just a single subpopulation. You want a broader indication and you have to convince regulators that with a single clinical uh, phase three clinical trial, you are likely to extrapolate to either younger age groups or likely to extrapolate to other surgeries other, other, other populations. So it is with only that phase three clinical trial is 55%. Uh, and the overall would be a 23%. When you go back to your famous calculations, then you'll have now a minus $200 million. Again, this is a 45 conference. It is for you to start getting the concept. This takes several months to get to all those numbers, but get all those numbers. Otherwise, you are embarking in large investments with any value-based based decisions. Okay, give me a couple of examples. Who can give me an example of the, because those are real examples. So what I told you, I'm not invented that. I mean, those are real examples of vaccines that, that have been developed. Give me an, <laughs> this one is very easy. There are many. Give me an example. Who wants to give me an example of the microbium horribilis, the clinical development one? What was based on correlates of protection? And you cannot answer. Um, pneumococcal conjugate vaccines. What else? 
the mm -hmm. second generation of pneumococcal conjugate vaccines. What else? Meningococcal, meningococcal conjugate vaccines. Well, measles, yeah, I mean, the second generations, I mean, HIV, I mean, all of those that you've established a correlate of protection, if you want to do a second generation, even for meninge, um, you didn't do uh, a phase three for meningitis, for example, to a conjugate vaccine, but based on polysaccharide vaccines, based on SBAs, you were able. And those clinical trials, those feasibility, the probability of success is much higher. Give me an example of, of, of the right one. CMB. Uh, RSV. Uh, no. Not RSV. It's not a subpopulation. I mean, I'm just doing for, um, I, I'm just doing for age based. And then, and then, and then after that, you go. The example, that's a, a little bit tricky. The example. Malaria? Stuff so, okay. That's, that's the example. So the example is that you do it for a surgery, a surgery you want to have. Yeah. You want to have a broad based indication you do for a, um, I don't know, hip surgery. And then you want to extrapolate that to, to other surgeries. And that was very, very tricky. And, and normal, and Norman could, could tell you how tricky. I mean, there was a verpack. I mean, there was, that was, that was a tricky and it failed anyway, but it was, it was a tricky, a tricky vaccine. Okay, now financial opportunity. I mean, what are the criteria when you think about the financial of opportunity of a vaccine? What would you, what are the considerations needed to evaluate its financial opportunity? Remember that you guys told me, oh, two billion, two billion dollars. Why, why two billion dollars? Okay, because there is a bunch of considerations once you have um, a TPP, once you have a technical product profile, I mean, you are trying to say, okay, if I have this label, this is how I'm going to introduce the vaccine. What it is that you, you need? What considerations? Give me a bucket of considerations. Okay, those are economic considerations. Yes. What else? Cost, um? cost effectiveness. Well, cost effectiveness, that's what everybody has said. That's the that's the um that's one consideration. What else? Epidemiological considerations. What else? Programmatic considerations and clinical considerations. Very good. But again, not only, I mean, it's morbidity, mortality, disease awareness. Is this an epi epidemic prone or not? Availability of alternative treatments, AMR. So those are epidemiological. You've talked about access and programmatic considerations. What are the number of doses? What is the vaccination schedule? One dose much easier than four doses. Isn't it four doses? The four dose, nobody takes the four dose. Um, H base, you can try from the laptop. Um, H base, H base versus, versus at risk recommendations. H base is much better. If you vaccinate 60 and over, or if you vaccinate 50 and over, much, much better than if you vaccinate only COPD. Um, uh, permissive versus routine recommendations. You have the clinical considerations, safety and efficacy, duration of protection. From a cost effectiveness perspective, it's much better if you have to vaccinate every five years than if you have to vaccinate every year, isn't it? Boostability, the breadth of coverage, you are, um, and then, and then obviously the, the commercial considerations, cost effectiveness, existence of competitors, reimbursement mechanisms and uptake. Um, finally, because I see that Adam is threatening to expel me from here, um, it's the clinical development cost. Okay, though this is the other third element. And what I welcome uh, now is a new concept, and this is the productivity index measure. So let's take into consideration what I uh, told you before, which is the expected net present value. And this is 100 million from both the vaccine A, our vaccine, and vaccine B. Again, one in present value for vaccine A, it cost me $200 million. Vaccine B, it cost me only $40 million. So when you look at the expected present value, both of them have the same number. 
But if we divide the expected net present value by the present value of the expected development costs, we calculate the productivity index. And as you can see over there, EMPV divided by the development costs give you a 0 0.75 EMPV per dollar invested. So it is much better vaccine B. It gives you a productivity index much, much greater. You get much more from what you are, from what you are investing. So, um, if you are, again, my colleagues are still in Bacurion and they have all of this portfolio, um, now, I mean, you guys now are the CEOs. You do not, you need to make decisions. You have all of these, of these, uh, vaccines in your portfolio, but you have the really bad news is that you have only $200 million to invest. So how would you order this? All of those are vaccines. If you have two million, um, two hundred million dollars to invest, what would you do? How do you order them? Okay, I don't think you can be a CEO yet. Um, so, um, really, really, one potential solution, there are many, but one potential solution is that you will order vaccine candidates by decreasing productivity index. So, if you have $200 million of investments, one you look at the cumulative net present value and one you look at productivity index, Unfortunately, the cutoff will be in, uh, in age and vaccines G, our microbium horribilis and C will not be funded, will just be defunded. And those are the considerations that one need. Now, the story, this is not the end of the story. Um, I think what I've tried to show you in this short conference is that vaccine candidates for an investment in vaccine candidates, you need a specific analysis that are incorporated into a portfolio level decision making. But again, I mean, big, big uh, corporations have other types of decisions. Management judgment is also incorporated. When I say management judgment, what do I mean? There are many. I mean, you want to maximize value. That's the analysis, the value-based analysis that we went through together, but you want to maintain a portfolio uh, balance in terms of disease, technologies, risks. Remember that this is Vacurion, it's only for vaccines, but me at Pfizer, we have to compete with oncology. We have to compete with internal medicine. We have, I mean, I'm, I'm for my colleagues, the same, the same thing happens. You have to maintain an alignment with corporate strategies, support the right number of projects, not invest everything into, but just have a healthy portfolio. And then you have corporate responsibility for public health, whether to develop vaccines for uh, the prevalent world or also develop vaccines for the pandemic. Control, but at risk without asking for investment. Now, in summary, I think I've shown you that, that, that vaccines are really, uh, growing and are growing at a faster pace than other, that other molecules. So the business model represents an attractive area for investment in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, there are multiple vac uh, vaccine candidates. I mean, you can think and you will be hearing throughout all, um, this course, many potential ideas for new vaccine candidates in all the segments that, that we've talked that would have great value. But because, and, and every year the development costs are higher, they're very, very high development costs and there are financial constraints. Industry is forced to assign a value to each of the candidates. You have to assign, you have to persuade your board um, in order to get that, that funding. For organizations that wants to grow in value, the expected net present value is the measure to use. The expected productivity index is the measure to use to help prioritize projects when we have more projects than capital. 
And obviously, whereas value analysis, I think you all will agree with me that it's that it's a useful tool that everybody, not exclusively the private, but also the public sector should start using is 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 useful to make sound investments. Management judgments needs uh, are also ultimately needed. Thank you very much. Any questions? Great, we have time for a few questions, so hands up. Yes, and then you next. Thank you. Um, thank you for the nice presentation. This uh, you present on the perspective of industry. Tell me, tell me your name so oh, that I sorry, can Sorry, I'm, I'm Tan Yui from Thailand. Um, That's a difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so I just want to know that if we put the public health at the center, what is the role of industry and uh, philanthropist, donor, or or some um, stakeholder to drive the, the the development of the vaccine, especially for neglected disease or for population right. that is in the low middle income countries? Yeah, I mean, so that probably requires. I mean, I think that that um, that's a great question, and that. <laughs> And that probably requires um, uh, another another lecture. And probably I'll have my opinion. Others have have other opinions. I, I've been in the public sector for many years. So half of my career, I was actually doing vaccines for the most impoverished, whether at WHO or at the International Vaccine Institute. So I know that that area. Now I'm in the other. I mean, corporate New York. I mean, you cannot have kind of uh different and i think both of them uh need each other um i um i think the pr public sector by itself is just very difficult to have the know-how i mean at the end of the day and i i haven't discussed about this but um it's not really the clinical trials what it's really difficult it's not really the epidemiological studies is the cmc i mean is the chemistry manufacturers the the essay validation so there is no other way that i can think of um but doing a a, a public private sector partnership i mean i think and i think well obviously um with the covid 19 that's what happened i mean everybody was incredibly generous i mean the 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 regulatory the regulatory authorities were reviewing this very high many manufacturers received funding to do clinical trials to do so so but that was i mean i don't think that that's the best case because that was a threat for the entire humanity so at the end of the day everybody was was um putting what you are talking about is i don't know uh, schistomas, uh, schistosomiasis or uh, Chagas disease or I mean that's very complicated because the return on investment is very very low you have to then have I mean there is always when I was working the so-called pull and push mechanisms remember that when we tried I mean I, and I'll give you an example about this um, and, and perhaps my colleague unfortunately uh, Suresh who was giving the lecture of the SII uh, passed away last year, but he was my partner in crime for the Meninge, for the Meninge A. We wanted to do at the time a Meninge A vaccine in the meningitis belt countries. At the time when I went to Wyeth and, and we got a $70 million um, grant uh, from the Gates Foundation. And when I went over there, People looked at me and they said, look, this $70 million is our profit for one month of another new, of a new myococcal conjugate vaccine. The opportunity costs, if I evolve all my people that are now in CMC that just to do a meningitis A for 50 cents a dose to, I cannot justify that. We did it with Serum Institute of India because they had the opportunity of transfer of technology so that they could do now that they're doing very well, um, pneumococcal conjugate vaccines and, and meningococcal. So that worked out well. Now, I think every case is different and you'll have... Uh, it can, it's impossible because at the end of the day, the only way that industry can invest in Alzheimer's disease is, is if you get profit that you can reinvest. So you cannot be in that extreme. At the end of the day, you need to ask industry to have corporate responsibility. Try, 
I'm, I'm putting the public sector, I'm putting the private sector together to me. It's the only way to go forward, understanding what are the needs of the different stakeholders. It's a long and convoluted answer. I'm sorry, I couldn't, I cannot, I don't think anybody here can give you, can give you a straightforward answer is as much as I, I can. Over there. Right. One more question, then we have to stop. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Renske Hesling, Seppi, um, in your probability success analysis, you only looked at the clinical trial uh, fixie success. Would you normally also consider safety risks, CMT related, manufacturability probability yeah. success? Well, um, yes, of course. I mean, uh, safety is important. But what, what I, because I couldn't complicate this so much, is the manufacturing. Uh, sometimes you simply cannot develop, even if you can develop and do the clinical trials, but then, then it's extraordinarily complicated to do at a scale. So what it's, what are the cost of goods? I mean, uh, even if you can develop it, the cost of goods are so high that sometimes it doesn't really matter whether that vaccine is going to work or not. You are not going to be able to develop at, at, at any scale. So in that, value based today i only looked at the um the ptrs the probability of technical success because it is so complicated that we only looked at different clinical development programs you have to look at manufacturing as well you have to look at cmc i mean all of this is part of the probability of technical success otherwise you cannot Louis, thank you so much.